marriage, baby, carriage. Marriage is what brings us together. That's for some of you out there. How many of you that worked for you? Like, you're like, hey, I watched that movie. Okay, like five of you. I'll do a joke even for one. That's good. Last week, we talked about love. What is love? Uh, quick little recap. What is love? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient, love is kind, doesn't envy, it doesn't boast, it's not proud, does not dishonor others, it's not self-seeking, it's not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. So when people use love as a cover for perversion and evil, the Bible specifically says that's not God's kind of love. Love does not delight in evil. Anyway, it always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. It never fails. And last week I I gave a little illustration. One of the popular sayings in our culture is love is love. Love is love. Such an innocuous saying, and it sounds good. If you don't, as long as you don't use your brain, uh, it, it actually is philosophically, you know, it makes sense. But the moment you begin to think, you're like, well, what does that actually mean? Love is love. And are there any parameters on love? Like, because uh, if there's not, then it's okay for all kind of perversion to, to, to be present. We talked about the reality that God is love and that he doesn't love everything. And we talked about a little bit well, that uh, we should not love sinful pleasure, 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're not supposed to love ourselves, 2 Timothy 3, 1 and 2. It says, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves. Well, love is love. The Bible also teaches us in John chapter 2, as I talked about last week, that we're not called to love this world, meaning the value system of this world. And I gave you a little illustration that I hope that you would remember. Uh, when people say love is love, and it'll go into today as well, love is love, uh, it's sort of like saying water is water. And if I offered you the, one of these waters today, if you were thirsty, you'd be like, man, I'll take that. And But what if I told you I got one of these waters from, well, I got one of these waters from the toilet this morning, same packaging, and one of them I got from uh, Wally World, and and but if you, are you still thirsty, I'd love to give you one. I'm just not going to tell you which one. You'd be like, no, I'm out. I'm good. Because all of a sudden, water isn't water. Now, is it still water? Yes. But, but one type of water will, will refresh you. The other type of water will harm you. It'll do destruction to you. In the same way, when the Bible talks about love uh, and each of these things, we need to understand what he's saying. So the Bible talks about two main types of love, phileo and agape. Phileo is the love of impulse or friendship, affection. It's all about feeling. I feel, I feel. And it's good to have feelings, but it's not good to be led by them. How many of you have ever felt something that was wrong before? Everyone. Everyone. We've all felt things that were wrong. We've all felt things in the moment that, given enough, enough time and space, we're like, hey, glad I didn't act on that feeling. Glad I didn't go on that date. Glad I didn't make that decision in that way. Now, the agape love is, uh, is the God kind of love. That's the, the perfect love that's not based on circumstance, but it's that love that I just read about in uh, 1 Corinthians 13. Now, you can't love God without phileo love, feelings and agape love at the same time. You can't love God and serve him when you feel like it, then choose not to serve him. Because love is based in the will. That's why God commands us to love him. And yet he's not like, hey, if you ever feel like it, the mood hits, like go to church, like, you know, worship, do all those different things that I said in my word, and kind of love me in that way if you ever feel like it. That's not what he says. He calls us to love him and it's a decision. Here's what we said last week. Love is not. Love isn't love. It makes no sense. Love isn't lust. Love isn't perversion. Love isn't a feeling. It isn't, it isn't whatever the world says it is. I love this quote by Dr. Ed Cole. It says, love desires to benefit others at the expense of self because love desires to give. Lust desires to benefit at the expense of others because lust desires to get. And God calls us to love. And so if you want to have a great relationship, you want to have a great romance, you want to have a great marriage, you want to have a great life, you need to understand this foundation of what love is. So today I'm going to answer the second question, what is marriage? 
Well, marriage is marriage. I know the world says that. Marriage is, is kind of whatever you want it to be uh, uh, from their perspective, which we'll talk about in a moment. But here's a quote that I love about what marriage is. And I talked about some of these thoughts in our biblical biology series just a few years ago. Here's what marriage is. Marriage is the God-ordained, lifelong, covenantal union between man and wife. It's designed to provide men and women and children optimal stability and overall well-being. Marriage is that biologically, spiritually, and morally centered institution calculated to ensure responsible procreation and perpetuate the human race. Marriage, real marriage, represents the fundamental cornerstone of any healthy society, or at least any society that hopes to survive. So it's kind of an uh, interesting, I know that's a lot, that's a big quote, and I'm going to break down what the characteristics of real marriage really are, because there's a lot of cultural confusion around that. If I say I love someone or something, then I can marry it, and God's great with it, and everybody else should be good with it as well. Um, in the Webster's Dictionary, uh, marriage is called the state of being united as spouses in a consensual and contractual relationship recognized by law. The biblical definition is this. Marriage is a special God-approved agreement or covenant between one man and one woman. It's the building block of all society and creates a new family unit. It reflects Jesus and his church. Let me show you some pictures real quick. Here's what marriage is, and then we'll go back to the scripture. Marriage is not anything else that, uh, that we're going to teach today. So marriage is not, according to People Magazine in 2020, uh, it's been all over since then, uh, HGV, HGTV, House Hunters did their first episode featuring a thruple, not a couple, it's three. And you will see this, uh, it's already in motion, it's already a push to be legalized, that you can marry whomever and whatever. Because if you can define mar marriage based on your feelings and not on fact and not on something concrete, observable, some moral framework, then marriage can be whatever you want it to be. So uh, we see that people are, are marrying. Uh, we also see the redefinition of marriage. There's Pete Buttigieg uh, that, hey, you can just, you know, two gay guys just want to get married and buy a kid. You can call it a family. And culture's like, man, that's so beautiful. So I'm going to say, no, it's not. It's actually really sick and evil. Here, here's another one. I pledge to marry myself. Do you know in multiple states around the country, you can marry yourself legally? So you're like, that's a good idea. <laughs> some of you are so, maybe if you're dealing with selfishness, maybe you just need to stay with yourself for a while until you fix some things, but that's next week. Um, here's another one. Uh, there's a lady, I think it was just a publicity stunt, but she married her dog. It's weird. Married her animal, people are marrying trees, they're marrying all kind of things. So what is marriage? Genesis, chapter two. Genesis chapter two, are you ready? We're gonna jump into it, verse 18. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. <laughs> I'll make a helper who is just right for him. So the Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. Huh? <gasps> He brought them to the man to see what he would call each one. And the man chose a name for each one. I would have been good at that job. I'm really good with nicknames. <laughs> he brought to them to the man to see what he would call them. And uh, verse 20, he gave names to all the livestock, all the birds of the sky, all the wild animals. But still there was no helper just right for him. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. There was drool involved, I guarantee it. While the man slept, the Lord God took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib and brought her to the man. At last the man exclaimed, this one is bone for my bone, flesh for my flesh. She'll be called woman because she was taken out of man. This explains why a man should leave his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united into one. Now the man and his wife were both naked, but they felt no shame. They felt no shame. So when we talk about marriage, because you've heard lots of things about marriage, right? You've heard things about marriage like all marriages, you know, like 50% end up in divorce. And I'm going to talk about divorce. And some of you have been through a divorce uh, and, uh, uh, you know, it wasn't your fault. 
Some of you have been through a divorce and it was your fault. And I just want to let you know that God's grace is sufficient for you no matter what you face. But he wants you to learn from it and grow from it. Some of you are on the verge of divorce and, and I hope that this will help walk you back from the edge and the ledge. You need to know there's this narrative culturally it says, you know what? All the straight people that get married, they mess it up. They all end up in divorce anyway, statistically. So uh, who cares if, if, you know, two people of same sex, you know, a guy and a dog, you know, married themselves, whatever, because all the, all the straight people have already messed up marriage. But do you know that those statistics actually are not accurate? Now, there's way too much divorce, and the Bible talks about it because we're a fallen world, and it's a reality that you can't always choose <laughs> um, the outcomes of your life. The reality is, is it makes two people to make a great marriage. It takes one person to ruin it. So don't be that one person. So the actual divorce rate has never gotten close to 50%. It's just not true. The stats are all wrong. Uh, those who attend church regularly have an even lower divorce rate than those who don't. Most marriages are happy most of the time. <laughs> Where's the married people? Yeah. Simple changes can make a big difference in most marriage problems. And most remarriages succeed. But that's not what you hear in the culture. That's not what you hear from these statistics that are thrown out just to tell you that, you know what, it's so bad you just need to practice polygamy. You need to marry yourself. Go to, go to Washington, D.C. No shock that you could do it there, huh? We'll move on. So, Song of Solomon. We're going to talk about it a little more next week. We're going to dive back into the book it's going to be risque. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to encourage you how to have a great marriage. But we're going to take a pause from there and just going to talk about Solomon for a moment. And then I want to give you a theology of what marriage is. So you don't believe and live according to the lies of culture. Where love is love, marriage is whatever. And all these things that we pretend are magically true because debased evil people made it up and have put it on social media and the media. What's been true for thousands of years hasn't changed because someone uh, wanted to uh, create a cultural revolution. It's actually still true, and you and I can be blessed by it. First Kings chapter 11, King Solomon. Now, King Solomon wrote uh, the wisdom, uh, much of the wisdom literature of the Bible, uh, Love the book of Proverbs, Love Ecclesiastes, can be a little depressing, but good for perspective. And the Song of Songs or the Song of Solomon's and a great book about a love story. It's a beautiful love story. It's PG-13. Uh, it's, uh, you know, they're in love, they're together, they're making love, they have a fight, they come back together, they make up, and, and it's great. We'll talk a little more about that uh, next week. So Solomon knew what marriage should have been about, just like many of you listening today. But the reality was, is he didn't live up to what he knew. So he wrote the, he literally wrote the book under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. God puts it in the Bible. He knows how to have a good relationship because he had one. But for him, one wasn't enough. King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughters, Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites. They were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. See, in years past, they mistook the Old Testament and said you shouldn't intermarry, intermarry based on ethnicity, but that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches we shouldn't uh, intermarry based on values and beliefs. It says, nevertheless, Solomon held fast to love in them. Some people say, well, Solomon had all these wives just because it was just political arrangements and he was trying to keep peace. And that sounds good, but that's actually not what the Bible says. The Bible says that uh, they were from nations which the Lord had told the Israelites you shouldn't marry. And Solomon held fast to them in love. He had 700 wives of royal birth, 300 concubines, and his wives led him astray. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods. His heart was not fully devoted to the Lord, his God, as the heart of, his, of David, his father, had been. And right there, I was standing in the city of David where David's like, you know, 
castle or uh, what would you call, call that, where he lived. I was right off the Temple Mountain. As we stood there, uh, our God showed us off in the distance. He said, just off to the right, that's the mountain. That's the area where Solomon's wives lived, the Jewish people. It was, it was so awful because he permitted the worship of Molech and Astra, which was sexual perversion and sacrificing children. He knew better, and he didn't do better. He knew what marriage was. And yet he gave himself over to a cheap counterfeit that ultimately destroyed his life. Happy thoughts. Aren't you glad you came today? So I want to give you some characteristics of what the Bible says a real marriage is. Not what the world says it is. Not the opinions of of someone that had too many paint chips as a child or anything like that. I want to give you what the Bible says, or was that too far? The characteristics of a biblical marriage. Matthew chapter 19 says, haven't you read the scriptures, Jesus replied? (laughs) And they're all like, no. Our culture would be that way. And he says this, they record that from the beginning, God made them male and female. Now, I know that's debatable in 2024 over the last couple of years, but it's not been debatable for all of world human civilization and history. It's only in vogue in this last little bit. So we got to get some perspective of crazy town that's all around us. He made them male and female. And uh, some people say, well, they don't feel that way. Well, you know, I feel like a 6'6 NBA legend worth billions of dollars, and I'd be happy to give my autograph to you afterwards if you'd like to meet up with me, but I'm not any of those things. Verse five, and he said, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother. That's important. And is joined to his wife. And the two are united into one. So they are no longer two, but one. So let no one split apart what God has joined together. So a couple characteristics, and I'm gonna give you the code that we should follow for marriage, and then we're gonna dive deeper into that next week. Number one, marriage is, everybody say marriage is? Marriage is between one biological man and one biological woman. I should not need to add that uh, in that saying, but I added it even to our Constitution and bylaws as a church about 12 years ago because you could see the arc of where everything was happening even at that time if you're paying attention. Genesis 1.18 says, Then the Lord God said, It's not good for man to be alone. I'll make a, a helper fit for him. And then it goes on, verse 26. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image. Did you know that you are made in the image of Almighty God? You're special, unique, and valuable, called, chosen, set apart. You're not like the animals of the earth. That's why you go to the zoo to stare at them and they don't come to visit you. You're unique, fearfully, and wonderfully made. You're not evolving. You are created and God loves you. So let us make mankind in our image. So they can rule over the fish of the sea, the birds in the sky, over the livestock, and have good steak. Come on, somebody. Over all the wild animals, the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. So it's between man and a woman. What's the second thing that marriage is? It's a covenant relationship of unity and purity. The two are united into one. What he's saying here is divorce is not easy. It's not an easy thing. That's why you should avoid it if it depends on you. And it doesn't always depend on you. But if it depends on you, you should not think, well, you know what? I'll just get divorced and I'll be free and it'll be great and I'll be happy again. I want you to imagine taking two sheets of paper, super gluing them together, and then trying to pull them apart without tearing it. You will not be able to do it. It is physically impossible. In the same way, it is impossible to not do horrific damage to your life in the context of divorce. Like, divorce is not an easy out. It actually brings incredible damage to you, to your family, and those around you. And those of you that have been through divorce, you know this. And that's what I want to encourage you that are getting ready to be married, maybe married again or for the first time or wherever you might be, that you look at marriage for what it is. Marriage isn't broken. Sometimes people talk about marriage. I'll never get married again. Well, the problem wasn't marriage. How many of you have ever been in an accident before? And it was the other person's fault. 
How about it was your fault? How about it was uh, the poll at the, uh, what's that? It was right in the wrong spot. Yeah. I was gonna, I was gonna make a joke at my son's expense. Yeah, the, the, the poll at the gas station just jumped out in front of you. Terrible. Here's what none of us did. None of us said, you know what? I'm never driving again. Cars are terrible. I'll never drive again. Do, are you following the logic with me? Some of you said, I'll never marry again, as if marriage was the problem. Come on, everybody say, I love a little preacher. You know where I'm going with this. Marriage isn't the problem, you are. I am. If we don't live up to something, it doesn't mean it's not God's plan. It's not his ideal. It just means that we need to have a different perspective. I want to encourage you not to have a perspective that is disposable. Marriage is a covenant. It means, means to cut. Uh, and so the Hebrew word for covenant, you'll see it behind me, um, is, barret, is derived from the word bara, which means to cut or to eat. Uh, the etymological connection suggests that the making of a covenant involved cutting or dividing sacrificial animals, and sometimes even cutting one own, one's own body is a sign of commitment. This practice symbolizes the seriousness and solemnity of the agreement being made. Marriage is a sacred and binding agreement between a couple made before God and often witnessed by others in which they commit to love, to honor, and cherish each other for the rest of their lives. Unlike a contract, which is a legally enforceable agreement that can be broken under certain conditions, a covenant is a promise that's meant to be permanent and unbreakable. I want you to think about that for a moment. As you're considering and thinking about marriage, which uh, if you're single and you want to, to mingle, marriage is a blessing from Almighty God. Your parents may have been jacked up. You may have been product of divorce, but I'm telling you, you didn't stop driving cars because someone was in an accident. I want to encourage you, marriage is a gift and a blessing from Almighty God and the foundation for healthy societies. But we have to have a proper perspective. A covenant is an agreement to cut. So what they do in the Old Testament is uh, depending on the circumstance and situation, uh, an example, hey, we're gonna sign an agreement, okay, we're gonna sign this contract uh, for this property or whatever. They'd take an animal, cut it in half. They're gonna have some, you know, filet mignon later, but they'd cut it in half, part of the animal over here, part of the animal over here. You would walk together through the remnants of that animal, and at the end, you were saying, may what happen to that animal happen to me if I break this covenant. Say ups the ante a little bit, doesn't it? When you're dating, you're like, oh, they're so cute. I'd love to be with them. Okay, like how much would you love to be with them? To the point that you would never leave them and you would never forsake them and you would honor them the rest of their lives in sickness and in health and when they annoy you, because that's gonna happen. If you don't believe that, just ask my wife. She'll tell you all about it. Yeah, yeah, but I just don't feel it any longer. Yeah, but remember this right here, that cutting? Doesn't matter what you feel. It matters what you believe and what you've committed to. See, I want to challenge you to have a deeper perspective on covenant. It's not just a contract. It's not just a throwaway. And hear me, if you've been through divorce, I'm not condemning you. You understand what I'm saying because you have felt the pain of, of flesh tearing apart and you recognize and realize how serious this really is. Married people, I want to encourage you to stay united into one, as Genesis 124 says. Ephesians 5 reminds us as well. It echoes what it says in Genesis this man, uh, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother. They'll be united to his wife. They'll become one flesh. It's a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. God brought Eve, woman, out of Adam, man, to become one flesh. And that means for men and women to go back into that from which they were taken. Only men and women can become one flesh because women, uh, a woman was made from man. Men and women are biologically designed, and it's obvious. A first grader can figure this out. They are biologically designed to come together physically, to complement one another emotionally, sexually, and spiritually. 
God was created, or marriage was created by God for one man and one woman. And Hebrews 13, four reminds us that marriage should be honored by all. The marriage bed should not be a throuple. It should not be anything else coming in. It should be kept pure for God will judge. Now here's a happy thought that you don't hear very often in our uh, church age of today because we're scared to offend anyone with truth that could actually set them free. But the Bible says that God will judge the adulterer and the sexually immoral. So here's my encouragement to you that maybe you're spending too much time lingering with that person at work. You've been messaging that person, person online and you don't think it's any big deal. You're in dangers of the fires of hell and God will judge you if you don't turn from your sin, repent and honor the spouse of your youth and honor the Lord your God. Aren't you glad you came today? For someone, you need to hear that. You said, man, that's hard, that's heavy. I know, but what's heavier is the outcome that's promised if we don't lean into that. Marriage is a lifelong commitment. Genesis 2, remember, God caused Adam to fall into a deep sleep. She'll be called woman, He's taken out of man. Let no one split apart what God has joined together. And Malachi chapter 2, 16 says, I hate divorce, says the Lord God of Israel. So guard you, uh, yourself and your spirit and do not break faith. Here's the reality. The grass is greener where you water it. It may look greener on the other side, but here's what you, here's what you find out the older that you get if you pay attention. All those people that have great marriages, all those people that you look up to, they have issues too. Starting with this guy right here. They have issues too. You just you say, you know what? what? No matter what the issue, as long as I don't have plan B, like I told my wife, if you ever leave me, I'm going with you. We're in this together. Okay? So you can get mad if you want. <laughs> but I'll, I'll see you upstairs. Like we're, we're in this together for the duration, for the rest of our lives. We can be cellmates or soulmates. Either way, we're locked in, baby. And when you're locked in, it's amazing what you can work through. When you don't have an out, when you don't have a side game, when you don't have a wandering eye, when you don't have another, like, it's amazing what you can work through because you can come together and you can become one and you can have a generational legacy and blessing that comes through that. Some of you, you tried that, you lost it, and but I wanna encourage you, God's mercies are new every morning and it's not too late for you. Number four, marriage should be full of love and mutual, mutual love and respect. Here we go. Ephesians 5 says, uh, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Well, Sam, I don't like that. It makes me feel uncomfortable. It makes me, that, it should, what does it mean, submit? It's exactly what it means. It says, wives, submit to your husbands. You can do an in-depth, uh, in-depth study and it'll still tell you the same. Now, if he's being evil and telling you to do wicked things, uh, then obviously you don't submit to that. You submit to the Lord before people. You submit to God before government. But if you want to, can I just pause for a moment? I'm just throwing stuff out by the, by the Holy Spirit. Uh, some of you say, man, I, I, you know, I want my husband to lead, but every time he leads, you question every decision he makes. And you wonder why the relationship is so wrong and why he won't step up. I wanna encourage you to encourage him. Within every man is a king and a fool. And ladies, the one that you speak to is the one that you'll experience. Men, within every woman is a queen and a fool. And the one that you speak to is the one that you'll experience. Your words are very powerful. And I wanna challenge you to choose wisely. The Bible says, uh, let's go back to 22. Wise, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. I know in our feminist culture, that is not popular. But the reality is, is I believe that every woman desires, at least it's not broken from, from sin and past, desires a man that would lead. For husbands, you have a part too. This means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. And he gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. 
Instead, she'll be holy and without fault, verse 28. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. We all love ourselves, don't we? Even people that are like, I'm so depressed, I hate myself. You spend all your time thinking about yourself. We, the problem with us is not that we don't love her. We love ourselves too much. Come on, we all walk, when you look, let me prove it to you. When you look at a picture, you get your picture taken, and you look to see if it's a good picture, who do you look for? You look for yourself. Come on, isn't it true? Everybody else can have a scowl on their face, eyes closed, look miserable. You're like, eh, I like this one. It's a good one. <laughs> That's just the reality. So again, I say, Ephesians 5.33, each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Love and respect. We'll talk about it. Song of Solomon, we'll go there uh, next week. And I'm going to encourage you. Within that, let me make another statement here. The longevity, longevity of every relationship is decided by the willingness to forgive. You don't fall out of love, you fall out of repentance. And an unwilling heart to forgive. And you might say, well, you know, that, can I just tell you, if you keep swapping spouses, you're exchanging one problem for a new set of problems. I'll give you an illustration. Kind of lift it up a little bit. Uh, one of the greatest examples uh, uh, of this I love is one of the heroes of the faith, Billy Graham. There's an article they did on his family, and they were interviewing his wife, Ruth, and asked her what it was like when your husband was gone for like up to seven months out of the year. Did you resent that? And she said something that was really powerful. She said, five months of being with Billy is better than 12 months of being with any other man. That's focusing on the good when she could have said, you know what, he's gone all the time. He doesn't care about me. She could have focused on the bad, but instead she focused on the good in their marriage. It's an exa- it was an example to the whole country. Still example to us as well. Without missing a beat, <laughs> uh, they, they asked her again. They said, well, did you ever consider divorcing Billy during those tough years? Because you had tough years. All that travel, kind of unwise, and you know, is it tough season. And she said, well, I got mad at him, but I never considered divorce. Murder? Yes. Divorce? No. (laughs) It's fantastic. Fifth thing about marriage. The foundation of the family, marriage is the foundation of the family. It reflects the glory of God. Genesis 128, God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. We're living in a culture that's anti-human. You'll see that more and more. They'll use things like, you know, climate change, and they'll throw different words and, uh, that are out there. But the whole idea is that there needs to be less population because the, we should worship the creation rather than the creator. God made this world for you and I. It's actually uh, an antichrist spirit that wars against humanity, which is God's prized possession. And we should desire children. Children are not a burden, they're a blessing. Sam, you don't know how hard it is. I've had five. I get it. I know exactly how hard it is. It's a challenge. But what it teaches you, marriage teaches you how selfish you are. Children teach you how really selfish you are. See, here's the thing about marriage and family. Marriage is not simply for your satisfaction. It's for your sanctification. It's not simply for your happiness. It's also for your holiness. God wants to do something in you and I as we humble ourselves and we learn, how to be ser- we learn how to be servants because anyone who wants to be first should be last and be the servant of all, just like Jesus. So here's the code for every biblical marriage. That's what marriage is. That's a theology of marriage. You now have that. You can walk through that. You can talk through this with your kids because the culture and the world will tell you everything opposite, all based on phileo, all based on feelings, but not based on agape, love that will last. How many of you have ever uh, forgotten your password before? Come on, just wave at me. Yeah. Okay, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. And how many of you, you try to use the same password for like everything so you remember and then they make you change it. It's a bitter moment, isn't it? It is. Or you get hacked and, you know, all of a sudden like you're sending out friend requests to everybody from your Facebook and 
So what happens is, and this the other day, my wife texted me, and she was trying to get into one of our, uh, our streaming services, because we did away with cable to save money, and uh, then we bought all the streaming services individually. <laughs> Brilliant. She's like, hey, I'm locked out. I need the code, because you can't get in without the code. So if you go online for your bank account, you want to you know, you uh, pay different things, and you forget that, forgot password, you go back, but oftentimes it'll send a code to your number or to your email, and once you get that code, you plug in the code, like it opens and it unlocks everything, and you're good again, okay? So today, well, now we know what marriage is biblically, we know that Solomon wrote a good book, didn't live a good life, and didn't get it, like didn't have wisdom, at all when it came to marriage. He had love and then he had lots of loves became a living country song. But if you want to unlock the blessing and favor of God over your life, you got to know the code. So what's the code? And this this comes from a study that those of you at our uh, our marriage one night, uh, Jimmy Evans talked about this, but it's found in Genesis chapter two. Are you ready? Let me read it again. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother. Did you get that? You got to cut the umbilical cord. Mamas, can I just tell you that as they get older, just let let daddy help you. Cut the umbilical cord. You let them grow up. They need to have some adversity. They need to learn how to become men uh, so they don't marry someone that's acting like their mom trying to help them not be a little boy. See, oftentimes men, this is all extra by the way. Oftentimes men will say, well, she's nagging me. Stop, if she would stop nagging me and she would respect me, then I would, I would be good. But upon further review, she's merely sometimes holding you accountable for what you said you would do and you still have not done. It's not nagging, it's accountability. And if you'll make that change today and you'll love her, love and respect, then God will take your marriage to that next level. There can be lots of grace. So this explains why a man must leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Before my son-in-law married my daughter, like we had, I brought him through discipleship, we had discussions, we had tense meetings, we had phone calls that, that just, you know, some things every once in a while, I had some questions that were very direct, and I just let them know, like, y'all, you're not married yet. And after they got married, guess who became their biggest cheerleader? Guess who said, I'm for you because now you are together and let no man separate. Don't ever complain to me about your husband, daughter, and son, don't ever complain to me about your wife because you are now one. You got an issue, you talk to Jesus, you work it out with one another. If you really have an issue, go see a counselor, but never talk negatively about your spouse to another person because the seed of dishonor that will bring a harvest that will destroy the good thing that God has given you. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother, is joined to his wife, the two are united into one. Now the man and his wife were both naked. Okay, I got your attention again. And they felt no shame. So what's the code? We're gonna unwrap this a little bit next week. The code's this. One, first number, you'll be my priority. It's the law of priority. God first, spouse second. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother. When you got married, I, I love, I heard a preacher say this. When you got married, you didn't marry into a family, you created a new family. Maybe someone needs to hear that today. You're like, well, you know, you're part of the family. Like, back it away. Yes, but it's a new family. Respect and honor. Husbands, wives, you will be my priority. Your children are not the CEO of your family. When they cry, all heaven and earth stops, whatever they want, you go go with them. Because if you do that, the man will marry his job, the woman will marry the children, then one day the children leave and they won't be married at all. That's why your priority, if you wanna unlock the code of blessing and favor, so I watched uh, my mom bury my father after over 50 years of marriage, 
good times, bad times, but living the legacy, the blessing exactly as God intended as a now in 26 years of marriage, living out imperfectly, but still loving uh, every part of it, saying, God, I want that legacy. What's the code? Priority. Not sports. They're fine in the right place. Not other friends and people. First God, next your spouse, then your children. What's the second code? I will pursue you. He'll be joined to his wife. It's the law of pursuit. Pursuit is proof of passion. If you're in a a relationship right now, maybe you're not married and you don't feel pursued, end the relationship. If you're in a marriage relationship where you don't feel uh, pursued, you need to have a discussion about what that looks like and what you would like. Because the code to a great marriage is telling and living, you will be my priority. I'll leave my father and mother. I will pursue you, I'll be joined to my wife. Here's the third one. We're in a divine partnership. It's the law of partnership. They shall become one flesh. It's a mystery, you become one. That's the picture sexually. The first time a man and a woman have sex, and you could go through the details of this, and I'll hit it a little bit next week. You know that there's actually uh, blood involved. You're like, well, that's pretty graphic, Sam. Why would you say that on a Sunday morning? Because God has designed even your body for covenant and relationship. God is so passionate about covenant that even when you were you engage sexually for the beginning, it is a blood covenant that's meant to stand the test of time before God and your family and friends. We're in a divine partnership. They shall become one flesh. And the last one is the law of purity. I will honor you with purity. They were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. They were hiding nothing. What are you hiding today? what, What are you hiding today that's keeping you from the marriage that God wants you to have? We say, well, if I stop hiding it, then I'm going to be hurt. You're already hurting. There's a lot of hope if you come and say, you know what? I'm going to, I know the code. I don't have to figure it out. God put it right here in the scripture in Genesis chapter chapter two. I just need to make a decision. You're going to be my priority. I will pursue you. We're in a divine partnership. I'll honor you with purity all the days of my life. One day they'll bury you or you will bury them. And on that day, as you look back, you don't want to look back with regret. I wish I would have made them a priority. I wish I would have pursued her. I wish I would have seen our relationship as a divine partnership. I wish I would have honored with purity and not allowed those other things into our family and our world. Can I challenge you today as we close? Don't wait to the end of your life and have regret. Start fresh today. Now you know what marriage is. Now you know what the code is. You need God's grace, His mercy, forgiveness, and His power. And you can start that fresh relationship. Your marriage can be new beginning right now today. And today, if you're not right with God, that can be new too because that covenant he has, he shed his blood 2,000 years ago on his cross. He stretched out his arms on a cross. Jesus did. He said, I love you this much. And he died in your place and in mine so that you and I could be made new. We could have friendship and relationship with God. So let me recap as we close this and then Pastor Caleb is gonna come give you an opportunity to respond. What are the characteristics of marriage? They're between, and I know this is debated by some, but it's, we know it's true, one biological man and one biological woman. Everything else is a perversion, goes against the created order, and is condemned explicitly by God. And no Christian that's a follower of Jesus should ever say or determine or think otherwise. A covenant relationship of unity and purity a lifelong commitment full of mutual love and respect. 
and is the foundation of the family, reflecting the glory of Almighty God. That's for our benefit. The code? The code's simply this. Did I bring that up, guys? There you go. You'll be my priority. I will pursue you because we're in a divine partnership. So I will honor you with purity. That's a statement I want to encourage every spouse to say to their husband or wife today. That's the code, and I'm going to live this out for you. Would you stand with me as we close? Next week, we're going to talk about, we're going to have some fun. We're going to go back to Song of Solomon, how to have a great relationship. But now we know love isn't just love. Marriage isn't just marriage. There's actually principles that go along with them. God wants to heal you. He wants to restore you. His desire is to forgive you, to make all things new. No matter where your marriage may be today, no matter what season you may find yourself, there's so much hope and God's grace can bring you together and you can have what you've never had by God's grace and mercy. So in just a moment, Pastor Caleb's gonna pray over every married couple here today. Then he's gonna give you an opportunity if you're not right with God to make Jesus the Lord of your life. And I wanna encourage you before you leave this room, don't carry the guilt and shame. I shared some hard things today because God's word is also a sword. It cuts through the issues of life. The truth gets to our deepest needs so we can build the right foundation and have the blessing for our future. I wanna encourage you, God loves you and he's for you. And it's not too late for you. God's mercies are new right now, beginning today.